formal conceptual edition to Skinner's seminal framework for verbal behavior. Dr. Dermot Barnes Holmes is currently a senior full professor and uh, Odysseus Laureate at Ghent University in Belgium. Before that, he was a foundation professor at the University of Maynooth in Ireland, where he, his colleagues, and his students carried out one of the most ambitious and productive research programs in the history of behavior analysis. He is ranked as the most prolific author in the world in experimental analysis of behavior from 1980 to 1999. He is known internationally for the analysis of human language and cognition through the development of relational frame theory, or RFD, with Steve Hayes, and its application in various psychological settings. Their co-authored seminal text on RFT has been cited over 2,300 times, and by any measure, Dermot is the most prolific writer in the world in RFT. His translational research on RFT and psychopathology earned him the Odysseus Award by the Flanders Research Foundation in his position at Ghent University, as well as the APA Division 25 Don Haig Award for translational research the first time that award has been given to a non-U.S. citizen. I've always admired Derwin's work in these areas, but what I find particularly interesting and potentially groundbreaking is his work on a functional approach to cognition with his Ghent University colleague, uh, Jan de Hauer, a creative and productive cognitive psychologist in his own right. I would invite you in particular uh, to check out their 2013 paper in the Psychonomic Bulletin Review entitled, What is Learning? on the nature and merits of a functional definition of learning. What I find exciting about this collaborative work uh, that Dermot and Jan are doing is that it finally moves beyond fruitless and ultimately destructive theoretical chauvinism and demonstrates the value of bringing a functional approach to bear on traditional cognitive topics. This type of collaboration and integration is precisely what is necessary to move the experimental analysis of behavior forward and get it focused on what most people find interesting about human behavior. This collaboration isn't restricted to just learning and cognition. It has been applied to emotion, motivation, and even traditional psych social psychology topics like attitudes and implicit bias. Dermot's most recent work is focused on an elaboration of RFT and the dynamics of arbitrarily applicable relational responding, which you will hear more about shortly. In particular, Dermot is developing what he calls the multi-dimensional, multi-level framework of uh, arbitrarily applicable relational responding, and applying a fascinating procedure called the IRAP to investigate it. The IRAP, or the Implicit Relational Assessment Procedure, is an interesting elaboration on the implicit association test first developed by social psychologist Tony Greenwald to assess implicit attitudes and biases. Time doesn't permit an explanation of this procedure or the work that's going on in this area, but it exemplifies Dermot's conceptual sophistication methodological ingenuity and demonstrates why he's a world-class scientist. I urge you to check this work out. Look, I could go on a long time uh, about all the things that Dermot has accomplished and all the impact that he's made, but just let me say, there's probably nobody in the world better to present this tutorial. Please help me welcome Dr. Dermot Moore. Recognize myself. Um, <laughs> I'm looking around for somebody else to talk. Um, this is quite some turnout. Um, I don't often suffer from stage fright, but I want to. You do know this is an RFT talk. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to be clear, I'm usually there's you know, some guy at the back um, who wandered in accidentally. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'll do my best uh, not to put you off uh, the theory and the work around it, but I, I can't guarantee that. I'd like to start by thanking, of course, Squab and ABAI for inviting me to give this address. It's a, uh, a great honor to do so, uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here and, uh, and in San Diego as well, a beautiful city um, and wonderful people we've met so far. Okay, well, let me push on and see how far I can get. Um, basically, the idea that I was going to try and work with was to give you the background to relational frame theory, the history of it, where it was um, 2001 to around a few years ago, where it's now, where I think it may go in the future, 
Um, so, in one sense, this is a personal narrative. Um, it's just my opinions. I'm not speaking for every RFT researcher in the world. Um, uh, I'm probably I'm just speaking for our current research group in Ghent. When we get to the tail end of it, obviously early on, I'm probably echoing what many others have said and, and thought over the years. So, uh, the title of the talk then is Rachel Prey Theory, Past, Present and Future. Um, and uh, I'd like to start with a quote I came across recently, which I think captures what we struggle with as psychologists, not just as behavior analysts, but as psychologists, clinical, educational, social, and so on. Uh, I find it quite a funny quote, but I'll read it to you. Man finds himself, uh, as you can see, it's 1962, so excuse the rather sexist language. Man finds himself in the predicament that nature has endowed him essentially with three brains, which, despite great differences in structure, must function together and communicate with one another. The oldest of these brains is basically reptilian, the second has been inherited from the lower mammals, and the third is the late mammalian development, which has made man peculiarly man. Speaking allegorically of these brains within a brain, we might imagine that when the psychiatrist bids the patient to lie down on the couch, he is asking him to stretch out alongside a horse and a crocodile. Now, when I first read that recently, it was actually in the, 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 the front runner of a book by uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Julian Barnes, no relative, please don't think so. Um, and uh, it seemed to capture, capture for me the thing that, uh, the issue that we struggle with as psychologists, that we are a particular type of mammal that runs in certain ways, and we balance different ways of interacting with the world. Um, and I, I, I'm going to reflect back on this at the end of the talk, but I want you to hold this in mind because I think this is what makes our the challenge so 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 seriously difficult for us when it comes to human psychology and human language and cognition. Okay, uh, let me just say that the lecture here is based on an article that is to be published in the fourth coming issue of the Behaviour Analyst, or now renamed as of this conference, uh, Perspectives on Behaviour Science. Um, and so if you want to sort of, to, to prove something in the talk, so I don't understand a word of that, I really need to go read about it. This is a fairly decent introduction to it because I had all the, the uh, feedback and all of the autocritics that go with actually writing something rather than standing up in front of a large audience. This, no man or woman is an island, so here's a picture of the current research team in Ghent, and they very much contributed to the work that I present here today. Um, and so that's just a picture of them. And I said, this is a personal narrative. Well, let's start with background. What was the beginning? In the beginning, without you know, wandering into um, being Billy Gray or anything, there was a book by Skinner, Verbal Behaviour, uh, which was the first attempt uh, by a, a serious behavioural attempt, I think, to struggle with human language and cognition to a certain extent, language anyway. It was an interpretive work, um, but Skinner was clear on that. Um, but its impact, as we know, has been used in the narrative about psychology as to begin the downfall of behavioural psychology as we have shuffled off centre stage by the cognitivists. That's, I think, an apop apocryphal story. It's not really accurate. I don't think radical behaviorism was ever really mainstream. I think methodological behaviorism was mainstream. Radical behaviorism was always slightly left to field. Uh, and was Chomsky's review gu guilty of you know, destroying behaviorism? I don't know it wasn't, and so on. Um, the other thing, I think, is that uh, Skinner's textbook was very limited in its impact on basic research. To this day, you don't find many studies in JAP, for example, on the concepts he presented in the book. It's been far more influential in applied behavior analysis, particularly with the treatment of language deficits in uh, language disabled populations. That's not criticism of the book. Skinner would start writing in the 1940s, and so the role of derived stimulus relations, which have become so central 
not just for RFT folks, but for uh, Kumlas folks as well, that we're getting in language. He didn't even have conditional discriminations really at his disposal in the 1940s when he first started writing the book, let alone on Kumlas relations. But interestingly, derived relations are in the book. They're quite late, and he waves a hand at them, but he was aware of them. Um, so they are there. Um, so, but it was, what's important about it is the most important thing for me is Skinner says, human language will yield to an operant account. And he followed this up with something that was far more influential just uh, less than 10 years later with um, the um, concept of rules or instructional control in trying to deal with um, problem solving. Now we're moving towards cognition, not just language, but cognition itself. Skinner lays the groundwork here, and there are countless studies now in JL over the next couple of decades and beyond on rule governance and rule following. Some of that struggles with the fact that humans and animals respond differently on re reinforcement schedules, and some of it deals with rule governance itself, the different sort of the differential impact of describing contingencies versus describing performance and the like. But what Skinner does here is, is, is formidable, and I think it's sometimes misunderstood and, and, and uh, glossed over. He changed the unit of analysis for human beings from uh, direct contingency control to selecting instructions and selecting complex sequences of verbal stimuli that um, remove the need for the human being to contact contingencies directly to interact with the world in a successful, meaningful way. That's sometimes overlooked. Fundamental. The unit of analysis would never be the same again for human folks. Um, and I, I don't think he made the skin or saw the implications of this himself when he did this, but the unit of analysis changed fundamentally. Um, now, the one thing Skinner didn't give us in that is he said that we will specify contingencies. The man who gave us an answer to that question, and in a way it's another giant upon the shoulders of which many, I and many others stand, was Murray Sidman when he came up with the concept of uh, equivalence relations. He cracked specification, but in a way he cracked one of the most fundamental um, things in human philosophy and psychology, he cracked meaning itself in a monistic, functional, analytic, non-dualistic way. That was a remarkable, in my view, a remarkable, the most important thing he did. I know he's known for similar points and tactics and, and uh, coercion in its fallout. They're wonderful reads. I actually have my, my, my wife and my partner uh, in, in, in crime as well as my partner and I will testify. There's uh, literally a copy of Tactics and scientific research on the bedside cabinet kind of next to me, <laughs> such as my adoration of Morris. <laughs> um, and notice that it's, it's tactics and scientific research. It's not it's not um, equivalence relations, although that's a wonderful read. Um, so, but he did this a remarkable thing. He cracked meaning by coming up with the concept of equivalence relations, and he knew it was controversial. Um, but way back in 1971, he did only a few years, five years after Skinner proposed rule governed behaviour, said the units are different, Murray breaks meaning and tells us what specification means. He says it in this book. He breaks it, said this is what Skinner meant when he said specifications, actually, that if you want to read, go to the end of the book and if you want to see how revolutionary Sidman was, look at the exchange between Sidman and Willard Day. Um, who was at the same university at that point before his untimely death as Steve Hazen did on that. Um, and Day resisted him. He chided him for suggesting that equivalence relations provided a functional analysis of meaning and, and quoted Skinner at him and said, this is mentalism. Um, not at Steve, but at Sidman. Um, and Sidman came out to, I want to listen to you, was a gentleman through and through, still is, but unfortunately his health is so, such that he, he can't travel anymore. But he chided him and skips him and came back very respectfully and engaged in this dialogue in letters, not an email, because email wasn't available at that time. Um, 
a wonderful read. Go read it. It will open your eyes to where Murray was at and the contribution he made. And the contribution he made, and I say this out loud, it's kind of bizarre, but the contribution he made to relational frame theory. And when Murray first published the first article on equivalence relations in 1971, I was probably literally holding my mummy's hand going to school, uh, in primary school. Little did I realize that what he'd done in 1971 or 19, probably 1970, given the publication like that, would shape my professional and personal life uh, 30 to 40 years, um, in, you know, even longer. Yeah. Uh, 50 years later, <laughs> gone. <Okay. laughs> um, now, what followed on by the 80s then, um, Steve Hayes, who was a clinical psychologist, was trying to grapple with the idea of rules as a way of trying to understand human suffering, human psychopathology, and seeing that excessive rule control was a problem. Rules are great, they help solve problems, it means you don't have to, you know, to eat undercooked chicken to get sick and realize you need to cook it properly to not get sick. Um, and, but so it seemed to be suggesting that rules were a problem, and he was trying to develop a modern behavior therapy that spoke to rule governance, but he didn't have specification. Murray gave him the key. And so what Steve added to the mix was the idea that rules, um, or that equivalence relations rather, were a type of operant behavior. And if they're operants, the next thing that, that falls out of that is they are myriad, they are legion. It's not just one derived relation of equivalence. They are, they're, they're, once you get the verbal sophistication, they can practically make them up at will, but they seem to be a relatively core cool number of them, like equivalence, opposition, difference, comparison, and so on, that have been the subject of experimental analysis over the years. Now, Steve published a book then, uh, or edited a book, in which he had two chapters that he wrote with this then, uh, Michael and Hayes on rule, uh, rule governance, in which he, they introduced the concept of the basic idea behind RFT and how it can be used to provide a functional and take account of rules. And, uh, and there's another uh, uh, chap chapter appears in another book, Dialogues of Book, I think that appeared at that time. Now, the idea of um, equivalence as an opera was a step, again, that made relational frame theory, relational frame theory. Um, Murray, it, the, the, these, these, these uh, things fall out of, or equivalence falls out of the reinforcement contingencies, but Steve said, no, they, they actually are, are established, and there are many of them through our interaction with the verbal environment as we develop. Um, and he published a small number of articles and further book chapters over the years. And then it's around this time, mid 80s, I was starting my PhD, read a couple of the very early works on RFT, and I was smitten. And that's how I spent, how I spent most of the rest of my career. Now, the basic idea, and I'm going to, this is a crash course in RFT, is that um, the most basic unit in relational frame is that, is that of mutual intent. It's symmetry and equivalence, but we use the terms mutual intent and RFT because there are very varieties of derived relations above, above and beyond equivalence, according to the theory. But the idea behind it is that you have to learn to do this. You don't pop out of the womb equivalence in, okay? <laughs> according to RFT, which is probably a good thing. You'd be a shock. <laughs> they get popped out and start talking to you immediately. Um, so they come out, they're not much use really, babies at that age, you can babies, you have to spend uh, uh, at least a year or two talking to them and, and, and doing the naming game and saying, oh, look, can you, mummy, it's daddy, oh, who's this, it's so. And so on. But in the process of doing that, you establish what some are now referred to as bidirectional naming, the type of naming that was appointed uh, to by Horn and Lowe back in the uh, back in the 90s when they first came up with naming theory um, and so on. But the idea here is that the operant contingencies select out and establish the bidirectional mutual interrelation, relation which is uh, uh, echoed here. So babies hear words, 
and then they're presented with objects, they are presented with objects and then the words are, are seen. And she just means nothing to them, they just hear blah, 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 and it means that but bit by bit through processes of things like um, mutual eye joint attention, the tendency for young children to cooperate, natural cooperation with their parents and focus on the same things, gradually you select out this operant, if you like, of mutual internment with respect to just um, coordination or equivalence. And then eventually, uh, once this operant is established, you can train in one direction and then get it for free in the other direction. But it's an operant that has been trained within the lifetime of the individual. It doesn't mean that we don't have a propensity for this as human species, but it's not something we're necessarily born. We have to learn to learn how to do this, and that's what you see here. So eventually the child is, you know, oh, here's stuck here, it might be a new toy, or you're, or you're bathing the child or something, and then you point to it. Where is Ducky? And if the child, is, they might not even be able to echo properly yet. If they just look towards the object when they hear it, they go, oh yeah, you know what Ducky is. And that ability to go back and forth, back and forth, uh, establishes uh, this for free derived relation at the lowest level. So from an RFT point of view, this is the lowest level of verbal behavior. It's the core. It's the atom of human consciousness, if I can put it so melodramatically, is that. Um, without this, there's no meaning. Um, without this, you don't end up being peculiarly mad or human, eventually. The next level, well, if you can do it with two things, why not three? The same idea applies. And this is what RFT is about, in part, it's about scaling up in complexity. So, three things. If this is the same as that, then that's the same as that, and the two things are mediated by the thing in the middle. This is the straightforward equivalence relation. And it's not difficult to understand how evolutionarily that we move from mutual entailment to um, combinatorial entailment. But again, it's something that almost certainly requires some learning early on. It has to be established. And you can imagine how very early humans uh, when the language first starts to evolve, it starts out with pointing and grunting, and eventually across time, words start to be formed, different sounds, only a small number of them, maybe in part because we stand erect, our vocal cords get elongated, we can produce a wide variety of sounds, and we stay crunching them. The theories are myriad in this area. Um, at the same time, our cortex is starting to evolve, so we can attend to these words and uh, produce the the sophistication that's required to um, uh, produce and discriminate various sounds. Um, so the next level of complexity then is the relational frame. It's a tiny network, but it's something that would evolve, we imagine, fairly quickly once you have mutual entanglement. There's two mutual entanglement relations combined to this, and yet there would be considerable survival value if now you can hear a word, see the object. Um, say the word is almost built into that. And then once you get written language, we're off to the races. The networks, of course, scale up to even more complexity. As we know, as you get older, the networks get larger. The number of relator elements within a network increase in size, and the number of relations start to expand dramatically. And this is where Chomsky really went after Skinner, if you recall. It was, what about this generativity? Once you get sigma, that falls away. I mean, this is a a sort of a kinship relations network, but you, the, the number of derived relations that fall out of equivalence, even just an equivalence class as the numbers grow, grow it gets scary. Uh, it's about like putting one grain of rice and then multiplying it when you put it in every square in a chessboard. By the time you get to the chessboard, there are more grains of rice than there are atoms in the universe. So relations get up, and of course you quickly get to a point where you can't utter you know, uh, all the words, sentences that can be uttered. Uh, given you know, a million times the length of the known universe that will exist. Um, the other level of complexity then that we've recognized more recently and I think is important is in the original MFT book, the lot of research that there the years, is the fact that you can relate relations. This is a real step up in complexity and it's been used as a way of modeling within RFT terms analogical reasoning. Um, 
Kids have difficulty with this up to about the age of five, six. It's only then they start to do this. Why is that? It's because you're not just creating a relational network. You're not just understanding instructions and following rules. Young kids can do, from fairly young age, you can tell them to do simple things with simple instructions. You know, open the door and let the dog out. You know, if it's barking and you put it, you know, that's an instruction. It's a fairly complex network. But once you get to related relations, the child is now emitting a relation response, emitting another relation response, and then relating those two relation responses. They are relating to their own behavior. And this is a step up beyond uh, the even rule following uh, or instruction control in and of itself. Once you get to this, now you're on the path to um, you know, scientific metaphors, scientific analogies, but you're also on the, on the path to what it makes us to be peculiarly human. And you're also on the path to human suffering, because now you can start to reflect on your own behavior. And this is at the root of, you know, why am I here? You know, what is life all about? What is the universe for? And so on. Where do I go when I die? Where was I before I was born? Because you're now asking questions about your ability to relationally respond about you, the world. And that's a scary place to go to, you know, philosophers and so on, and, uh, and the existentialists and what have you make a, a big deal out of that. But there's another level. You can also relate relational networks, right? This, there are two networks. Anyone in this room, look at that. Are you confused by it? <laughs> if you are, then, you know, you, 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 you're, you're probably not um, much older than five or six, seven. You look at it and say, yeah, they're the two, they're exactly the two same networks. And you can get even more complex. You can hierarchically organize networks into different types of networks. So here we have the very overarching, if you like, uh, um, uh, overarching concept of a network itself. Uh, and those networks can be contained hierarchically within networks. So here you have small networks on the left hand side large networks on the right hand side and the networks are related to each other in through the frame of comparison small to large so the networks on the left are smaller than networks on the right networks on the right are larger than networks on the left don't worry i'm not going any more complex than that okay because that's as far as rft has gone so far okay so rft is complicated um, it's scary and it's frightening, and it's also recognized, we've recognized, uh, uh, I put my hand up to it, it's controversial, and it remains so. Um, and it has been criticized also for being obscure and difficult to understand. Nevertheless, it has been successfully producing a, a, a wide body of work, it's been very good to me and my career, for which I'm very grateful. But. Um, I've had a recent concern, and there's indeed a recent review here by one of my, uh, well, not, not the whole of my institutes, Louise UQ is, one of, is an ex student of both mine and Yvonne's, and some of her students now at UCD in Dublin. Um, and they did a recent uh, analysis of the impact of RT, and as you can see from the graph, the, the trend is upwards. Um, I, I've sort of questioned or queried how healthy RFT is, though, in some respects. I have concern <laughs> that uh, a recent concern if we may go if you're offended by this, I was although I'm raised and born in England, I come from a, a, an Irish Catholic background, but my parents are Irish Catholic, so you know, I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> Tough. So. Um, but uh, more seriously, I'm worried that this is where we might go with RFT. We have the holy text that was written by, you know, um, uh, in the, in Steve and myself, or edited by Steve myself and Brian Rich and our colleagues and students at the time. And now we put it in a tabernacle and we pray to it and we don't question it. That's not science, that's cultism or whatever. We don't want to go down that road. It um, would be a dangerous thing to do. So, uh, in more recent time, start to think that we need to keep growing conceptually. Empirically, there's always work to do, and there's still work in the RFT book that needs doing. Uh, but I think conceptually, uh, the, 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 the current work that's been done and the future work that needs to be done needs to break free of what was 
presented in the book, or what's affectionately known as the Purple Book. And so, uh, some of the recent work that we've uh, uh, done this, and Mike mentioned it in his introduction, is to come up with a framework initially called the uh, multi-dimensional, multi-level framework, which tries to capture what RFD researchers have been doing, and to a certain extent, it captures what equivalent researchers were doing as well. And now with Boltman, I have to put the next slide up, and people sort of reel back in horror and say, oh my god, I was just getting interested in RFD, I just thought I'd give it a go, and now look what that has put in front of me. But anyway, so brace yourselves, here we go. Right. It's not as scary as it first looks. All this is is it's a framework for capturing what we were already doing and what equivalence researchers were already doing before or after researchers are doing right now. But it tries to formalize it. It's not a model, it doesn't make necessarily make any predictions, it's just a way of thinking about the work that we do in derived relations research. If you look down the left-hand side, these are the things I was talking about in RFT. Mutual entailing, framing, networking, related relations, and related relational networks. The last one on the bottom there is a pretty big one, because it's practically everything. Storytelling, narratives, you know, the, 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 and so on. It, 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 you know, with science, it's everything buried in there. I suspect that over time we'll need to make that more, compli more complicated, be sub-levels and divisions and so on. The, the other piece to it, and when I put it up there, is I'm also conscious of the fact that some of my colleagues do go, oh, well, that's terrible, it's way too complicated. But, you know, when, when were you first introduced to the periodic table at school in chemistry? I asked my, uh, my daughter this recently, and she said, oh, you're about 12, 11, 12. I said, do, do, you know, did you collapse down in a heap, weeping on the floor in front of your school teacher at that point? No, you didn't. Said, oh, right, oh, my God, I don't like science. Well, what the hell? And you went off with it. Um, and some people thought, wow, cool, complexity. Um, and they joined squat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I feel like well, I was offended by that. Um, so, but that's it. But we, it, it's sad to say human psychology is complicated, and the work that we do is complex because the subject matter is complex, and we need frameworks that reflect that complexity. And uh, this is something that's not just been resonated in, I think, in this work. But it's being understood more widely in people. And even in cognitive psychology, there's this pushback in mainstream cognitive psychology and what they call dualistic thinking. Um, the, the dual processes, you know, automatic versus deliberative, and so on. There's basically recognize that city um, and leading edge, cutting edge cognitive psychology, the leaders in the field with, with whom, to be frank, I now work in Ghent University. I live in the belly of the beast, if you like. Um, uh, and they're very nice to me. Times have moved on. They're, you know, they're really, you know, I like them, and I think they. I hope they like me. Uh, but well, they haven't, they haven't insulted me or anything like that. We're, we're, in fact, they give us a lot of money and give me a chair, so I can't complain. Um, but anyway, let's look at this briefly. So the left-hand side, all those are in the RFT book. I'm just explaining what about these things across the top, the code dimensions, coherence. Coherence just means. If I give you a trained relation, this is in all the things. If I tell you A is equivalent to B, well, is B equivalent to A? Yeah. Always saying that, that's coherent. A equals B, B equals A, that's coherence. If I say A equals B, B is not equal to A, that's incoherent. Not in and of itself, but because we haven't learned to equivalence in that way. Equivalence means A equals B, B equals A. Anything other than that is incoherent with the way in which I've been trained. Or I've been taught. That's it. Coherence. No big deal. Coherence is a conditional reinforcer. That's different. That's an empirical issue. But as a definitional thing here, that's all I'm saying. Uh, complexity. Well, or the phrase can be more or less uh, complex. Equivalence is a very simple relation. A equals B equals A. Simple. The same relations. What about comparison? Slightly more complex. If A is more than B, B is less than A. Two relations, not one, it's like more complex. What if I try and bring it under contextual control? This is stuff that Murray and his colleagues did. You bring in the context, say in this context, A is equal to B, and B is equal to A, different context, A is equal to C, C is equal to A. Just different in contextual control, more complex, mutual entailment, symmetry, nothing big about that, nothing worrying. Derivation, 
doing an experiment. What do you do? You train up the task, A, B, A, B, A, B, and you get them up to a level where they're reliably giving you that. Then you give them a test. You don't just test them once. How many trials do you give them? Maybe 10 out of 10. How many do they have to get right? 8 or 9 out of 10. They have to derive the relation how many times? 8 out of 10. You have to show the group that that pattern, you have to derive it 8 times out of 10 for it to be considered an equivalence relation. Anything less, it's not an equivalence relation according to the study you're doing. It could be 100, it could be 99 out of 100. It's up to you as an experimenter, but generally if you want to get published, you're going to choose something that's probably 80% or more correct. That's all derivation is. How many times do you have to produce a response? Not particularly complex. Flexibility. Philip and Galicia did work on flexibility back in the early 90s. They trained equivalence relations or the baseline relations A to B to C. They reversed the trained relations. Symmetry reversed, but not the transitive relations. So you get flexibility in one, but not flexibility in another. That's just one example of flexibility. The extent to which derived relations will change under various forms of contextual manipulation. So this is all the framework is. You can introduce other relations, you can go up to framing, you can go up to networking, relating relations, and in principle, a whole gamut of things, okay? So that the MDML in and of itself, I don't think is particularly scary. It's just a framework for organizing what we were already doing. Um, and then it can be used for giving and guiding us with in terms of future research and other things. Now, that, that is next bit is scary, but I'm not going to blow it. Now, the important point about the MDML, and this is where I'm just going to say, trust me, um, and, I, and, you want, and you'll want me to, you'll want to just trust me when I work with this, because uh, I'm not going to work through it, is that when I first put this together, I said I have to determine, I have to make sure that in principle, in principle, that all of these things can be done in the lab. Okay, I couldn't model these things in a, a, a lab using the traditional things. They, they, they're wrestling to the floor of the experimental laboratory. Uh, not as analog, but literally A1, B1, C1 type work, bog standard, you know, train them up, test them. And so I sat down and put a logical mathematical proof together after doing uh, this idea just to prove it to myself. It's not enough just to see things you have to prove them. And here it is, I'm not going to work through it because it would be a very dull talk and the room would end up the way it usually has been in my script. I talked about RFT. I learned over the years not to do that, so I won't hear. I'll just say, trust me, it's all in here. So there is the mutual entanglement, there it is for frames, there it is for networks, there it is for <laughs> there it is for related networks, okay? Right, okay, moving on. <laughs> if you want, you know, uh, uh, me to work through that with you at some point, I can do so, but you'll have to buy me a lot of drink and you'll be at least a whole night to do so. Um, of course, a lot of that work has been done, uh, but a lot of it hasn't, but in principle I think it could be done. Okay. There's another piece to, to, to RFT, which uh, I also should uh, introduce, which I haven't covered as a tutorial, and that's this dis distinction it makes between what we describe as c fumps and C-reels. C reels are the contextual cues, if you like, that control relating. And so far I've just talked about relating. You know, if A is the same as B, then B is the same as A. Same as is the real is the C real there, it's the context that controls the relation. But there are also contextual cues that control the functions of the events, the psychological meaning of terms, the impact it has on us as, as behaving organisms. And uh, RFT in that sense is more than an account just logic or reasoning, it's an attempt to deal with, because Steve was, it's a clinical psychologist, he was interested in trying to understand how language does its damage uh, uh, for human beings, uh, and so it was important that he dealt with um, the emotional impact, the psychological impact that stimuli have on us, and so it made this important distinction between C-reels and c as a contextual cues. So if I say to you, you know, uh, the name of uh, uh, the, the, the Spanish name for dog is Ferro, and the Dutch name for dog is Hond, H O N D, probably derived from Hound or the other way around, depending on who came up with language first. Um, 
So, and then I said, well, to you, okay, you know now, Pond, I'm not pronouncing any Dutch speakers, please apologize for my pronunciation. What does your, uh, you know, Pond is the, for, for dog derived through Barrow. Um, now, I can ask you, so what does, what does you, if you have a dog, what does a dog um, smell like? Smell like now becomes a sea farm, you know, so you know, a bit, bit wet, not, not particularly pleasant sometimes, unless they give it a bar. What does he look like? You can make a picture of and so on. What does he sound like when he barks? And so here I'm using other words to evoke different functions for those stimuli um, based on the fact you derive the relation between them. So stimuli have psychological impact. And we start to think about that stimuli then have, in focusing on this, in our work, have, can be thought of as having two important um, C fun properties, which we're describing broadly as orientation functions and evaluative functions. And they, these contain many things. Um, we use the term orientation in the same sense that it's just something you notice. It impacts you on some way, okay? It just stands out for you. Uh, orienting in the sense that before you expose a dog to Pavlovian conditioning, you ring the bell or hit the turning fork. The dog orients stores, it doesn't salivate, doesn't mean anything to the dog yet, but it still has an orienting function of the dog. So that's like that. So that's all. Does the stimulus, is it not in one without getting too epistemological? Is it a stimulus? If it doesn't orient you, if you don't notice it, it's not a stimulus uh, at that point in time. Uh, but also there are evaluative functions. So alongside orientation, we have the extent to which you can approach or move away from it. That's what I mean by evaluation, or saying something mental or internal. It's sort of the extent to which you want to approach it or get away from it for largely for survival values. You, you see it as positive and negative. And you can plot these in the grass. So you have spiders there. If you're spider fearful, they might stand out for you if they're in motion. They really will. You can go, what was that a spider? If you're spider fearful, you'll orient it towards it, you'll see it, and then you'll pull back because you evaluate it negatively. If it's not moving, you might not even notice it. And if you do, you might not orientate it strongly towards it. Um, and you might evaluate it quite as negatively if you did. A dog in motion, if you're a dog lover, you see it running, oh, there's a dog, and you notice it, you see it over the corner of your eye, it's a similar thing, you see it's a dog, and ah, look, dog, and you might even think about uh, going over and petting it if it's a close by, and you have your dog with you, whatever. If it's sleeping, um, generally, uh, again, you might not notice it as quickly, and you might not evaluate it as positively. Um, now, this means, and this is where we come back to this three part, that this has now started us to think about how we put these things together. You have these two C fun properties, orienting and evaluating. They're very broad, they're not mental, as I said, they're just ways of describing the way in which you have to re interact with the world. But we have relating, which I've talked about as uh, the um, MDML, but we also have the see fun properties of events that we just within the MDML, orienting and evaluating. And the point is that this is like what I've described as the holy trinity of the human psychological act. You won't find this in the public book or anything like that. It falls out of it, I think, but this is where we're moving into the future. And every human psychological act or meaningful act I think involves these three elements together, or analyzing them together to make sense. To call it a genuine human psychological act requires that as an, as, an, as, a, as an analysis. So conceptually, that's what we're talking about. Experimentally, you can just look at relating, or you can just look at orienting, of course, just as you can just look at reinforcement without worrying about the eliciting effects of the reinforcer. But it is the case that even when you're analyzing reinforcement in the lab, those reinforcers have eliciting properties. It's the same here. You can analyze relationally, you know, but you also, the, the, the stimuli have functions, even if they're just trivial ones like orienting. So I describe this as really that when we, what we're doing is we're relating, orientating, and evaluating, which gives us the acronym ROE, and if you pronounce it row, you can get back to that metaphor of the behavioral stream that we're literally rowing as human beings once you become verbally able. Every act is like a stroke of the oar as we go down our behavioral stream, and it's row after row after row after row, sometimes simple, sometimes complex. 
and you can't really pull them apart. And there's a wealth of cognitive psychology stuff out there that shows that you can't really separate, you know, attention from high order cognition and so on. That the idea that top down stuff is completely different from that. that's gone. That you know, there are serious problems that don't think that way, and we shouldn't think that way in RFT between verbal and non-verbal. Once you're verbal, you're verbal for life. <laughs> uh, there's nothing you do to deal with. You don't go, there's no back to you. Know, you don't have the Buddha didn't have Buddha nature, blah, blah, blah. It just isn't like that. Once you verbal, you're out of the garden of Eden forever. And in one sense, that's where I think these are just metaphors come from, the loss of innocence and so on. For me, they, they are metaphors for the fact that you emerge into a verbal world and forever more that world has changed the way you interact with it and everything you see, even just noticing things has a verbal element to it. You know. So, for example, one simple example, recently I was in Brazil. Um, I quite like spiders um, in Ireland um, because they're not poisonous, they don't bite me, they don't do I was in Brazil recently walking along and since I've seen move at the corner of my eye, we were in a, in a park. Lovely time in Brazil, a great time Brazil, it's a fantastic country, I want to go back again too. Um, but I don't want to get too close to your spiders. And so it's an awesome. <laughs> I look around, there was a spider and a web in it. You know, move quickly down. Even the Brazilian who was with me at the time jumped back. So, you know, I jumped. Uh, if I, so just noticing was that it. First of all, I noticed it and it had an impact on me, a real impact. And secondly, I evaluated it very differently from finding an iris spider, which I know are harmless. So backing away, massive difference. Why? In a second, because I'm in Brazil. Now, I've never been to Brazil. I've never, you know, been bitten by a Brazilian spider, but I do know verbally that spiders in Brazil can be a great deal more unpleasant than spiders in Ireland. The same would apply to, well, that's okay for spiders. What about dogs? Well, if I see a dog in Ireland, we don't have rabies in Ireland, by the way, and it's foaming in the mouth and aggressive bit, I would say, oh, that poor dog, we better get it taken to the vet, it's not well. If I saw a dog in Belgium foaming in the mouth, and barking at me, I would back off pretty damn quick because we have rabies in mainland Europe. And if that dog's foaming the mouth and aggressive, uh, it could have rabies. And if it might speak, I have to have rabies shot, not very quickly, I'm told. So, again, differences. The things I might notice my orienting and my evaluating are impacted upon my relating. It goes out, but it can go the other way. I, I relate, I, or I see something out the corner of my eye, just like before, and I'm saying, Oh my god, that's a spider. Is it? spider. That's dangerous. So now the network's building relatively and spiders. Why did they get on here? They, they can be, etc., etc. So, this is why the arrows are here by direction. So, we can't separate orienting and evaluating from um, relating. It's this ongoing to make sense of the human condition. And so, really, the bad news is that the MDML is more, even more complex. And I suggest I've never put this in. This isn't anywhere published yet. This is what we're working on at the moment. The MDML, I'm actually saying, is really a HDML, it's a hyperdimensional multi-level framework. Because within each of the 20 cells, which we called VARs, with the, at the time I wasn't thinking of South America, but somebody pointed that out to me in Brazil, it wasn't a great, great uh, uh, acronym. Well, uh, we were stuck with it at that point. Um, so within each of those cells, those little things are really the, the, the two-dimensional um, orienting and evaluating graph buried in each one. And so when you work with the MDML, I'm not going to do it here, but when you start to unpack the MDML in RFT terms, you need to deal with the fact that you are relating, orientating, and evaluating, and you can pull these things apart within the framework, and there are 20 units of analysis in there as well. Okay. So um, it's even more, a little more complex than I thought. But this captures, I think, the whole of RFT in a table. There's not much more to it than this as a tutorial. So if I've done you some damage so far, mm -hmm. um, I apologize and made it more complex than you thought. Um, I was going to say, give you give you a brief example of why I we've divided up that way. I made up by just sitting in an armchair. This is the result of two, two and a half years empirical work, um, just in the Odysseus uh, program, but beforehand as well. Uh, but uh, time is pushing on, so I don't, don't really have time to go through that. But the reason we've come up with this network is to explain difficult to explain.
explain things that we found with the IRAP, such as here, where we have one trial type in an IRAP which predicts actual behavior, but it's difficult to explain why until we break the uh, uh, performance on the IRAP up into orientating, evaluating, and relating. Um, and in so doing so, we now begin to make sense of data we couldn't make sense of before when we thought of the IRAP purely in serial terms. And initially, that's what we did. Um, here. Don't worry about the but we used to focus on just the serials there across the middle in red. We now, in analyzing IRAP data, also look at the functions that the targets and labels have for us. I'm not going to work through this here. When we do that, we can explain why, why um, we get this back here and that we get one trial time that predicts the other. And I wasn't going to do this without for squab, squab like numbers. We can actually model that, and I'm not going to work through it here, um, but we can, you can actually have a computational model that allows us to uh, put numbers to the model I just put up there. And this is why I want to reach out to squad folks. We need help now at this point. We need to uh, connect with an RFT research. We need to get with people who can help us to do some of the computational modeling that needs to be done to really do basic research with RFT that can not only be registered to the floor of the experimental laboratory, but that can be modeled computationally as well. And so, how will I end up? What's the take home message? Well, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, go to your, your Einstein, I think that's the case. And on the right hand side, you need to deal with the complexity of the human condition. Uh, the relational frame is no longer the unit, um, or the core unit. There are now 20 units according to the NBML. It's not straightforward. And the simplicity, the uh, distinction between verbal and nonverbal don't comply. To make, to understand that distinction, to understand what we mean verbal from nonverbal, it's no longer. We need to think about how these units vary along the dimensions of uh, complexity, derivation, coherence, and flexibility not in terms of whether they're verbal or non-verbal. To do that would be to make the mistake that our cognitive colleagues realize they made with all of the dual process models. Dual processing is no longer a serious, taken seriously in cognitive psychology. We should not fall into the same trap in behavioral analysis and divide the world up into verbal and non-verbal. And the, finally, the behavior dynamics in the HTML generate new models of RA that we can be that can be tested in the basic research authority and also in, in application. So to close then, what do I see as the historical background to RFT? It's Darwinian. Okay? We take simple, we build complexity because complexity is selected out of simplicity. It's a simple idea. It's Wittgensteinian, that's why we can sign up because he says in the philosophical investigations language is a game. It's not a representational system. It's not something, it's not picture theory. He gave that in the tractatus pull back on that and said language is a way of, it's a way of playing with each other. And that's why there's no private language, because it's a social game. It's, it's definitely Skinnerian, because it's an operant account, and Skinner gave us the operant. He gave us the first attempt to give us an operant account of behavior, and he gave us instruction and control. He changed the unit of analysis Forever, and it is definitely submanian because he cracked meaning. And without individuals such as that and the traditions they represent, not just them, but the traditions they represent, there would be no relational frame theory. So, as an RFT person, I stand on the shoulders of giants, um, which they are. And uh, I think the most important of these for me is, in a sense, Murray Sidman because he broke meaning. And that's uh, the most important breakthrough of behavioral psychology for me and my research career.